Up on the screen, I'm going to pick up where we uh, left off last Wednesday night, but I'm going to take a few minutes and dive into a psalm that um, God just laid on my heart uh, yesterday. So turn to Psalm 37, if you would, and um, I'll give you just a little background here on that. Uh, psalm 37, I'm glad you came tonight. Appreciate all of you that are with us online. We appreciate your faithfulness and your love and encouragement. Um, I got pictures. I, I should have put them in tonight. I'll do it Sunday. I got pictures of our four orphans and uh, they are looking great. And we got them some things for Christmas and they are doing well. And you pr continue to pray for them and that God would continue to uh, bless their life. They get a chance to learn. They get a chance to go to school. They get a chance to learn the gospel. And that's we want that we just give them a chance. Give them a chance. If you if you judge somebody by looking at them saying they're not worthy of the gospel, you're going to miss out. Somebody else will get your blessing. Because there's a blessing when you share the gospel with somebody. And they get saved. And so just give the gospel a chance to do what the gospel does best. And that is save sinners. Amen? Amen. Psalm 37. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your house tonight. Father, we thank you for snow on the ground. Every snowflake is unique. It's different. And yet they're all the same. How you do that, Father, I have no idea. But you know what every snowflake out there looks like. Just like you have names for all the angels. And a numeral, numerable amount. Father, you are God. You're the one who created the snow. You created the rain, the wind, the sun. Father, you are the one who made all of these things out of nothing. By the word of your mouth. Father, that word we hold in our hands tonight. Father, we ask for your blessings. Help us, dear God, to trust in you. To cast our cares upon you. To lean upon you. Father, you are good. Even when we don't understand you, you are still good to your people. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. or saints begging bread. I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would just guide us in your word tonight. Guide our hearts, open our eyes, help us to see things we never saw before. Give us encouragement. Help us, dear God. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, the next day or the week after that. So, Father, we don't have a choice but to trust you for all the things that we need in our life. We ask your blessings, Lord, upon your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, Psalm 37, let me just give a brief um, little summary of, um, we have, we've had, a, we've had a hard week, our family, and um, you know, everybody has enemies, and there is an enemy to our family, and that enemy sometimes it seems like they get it seems like they get the victory too much over over innocent people this person has lied cheated stolen abused members of our family and um it's it's very easy to be bitter and angry and it's easy to ask God, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you step in? It's easy to do that. And you've heard me preach Exodus 14, where God led Israel into the trap at the Red Sea. He had them camp at the Red Sea. He brought Pharaoh in, closed them in. And when they cried to the Lord, they complained to God. They murmured against God. What? You couldn't kill us in Egypt? You had to drag us all the way out here? Was there not graves? Was there not enough coffins in Egypt? So you had to drag us out here to kill us in the wilderness. That was their thinking. 
They were angry at God, and yet God did not get angry back at them. He went ahead and saved them and destroyed their enemies forever. Pharaoh, from that day, they didn't understand, but from that day, Pharaoh was not going to chase them ever again. Now, I've got Pharaohs chasing me. I've got a few Pharaohs that have been chasing me. And I've had to trust God with that enemy behind me to know that one day God is going to destroy those Pharaohs and they will never chase me ever again. Nobody likes to live their life looking behind them all the time. Amen? That's why Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. Let us press toward the mark. So, Psalm 37, I prayed last night and God laid this verse on my heart and I looked it up and the, the entire chapter, uh, I, I'm primarily preaching to my family, but who knows who's out there that's being done wrong by people. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. That was the verse that God laid in my heart as I was praying. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. This Epstein deal, this Jeffrey Epstein deal. Give you a little background. This man owns an island out in the middle of the... Caribbean or Caribbean, whichever you want to call it, is called Pedophile Island. And he's had some of the most wealthy, most powerful people in the world, Prince Andrew, Bill Clinton, and others, have been out of this island fornicating with underage prostitutes. There's probably a list a mile long of wealthy, powerful people that have been to this island. Epstein got arrested put in jail, and he was suicided. I do not believe he committed suicide. There is no way ever you'll be able to convince me that he committed suicide. That never happened. Never happened. So what, and what it looks like is, all these people that should be in prison right now are getting away with their evil deeds. We know the Clintons have been getting away with their evil deeds since he was the governor of Arkansas. You look up the Mena Airport scandal. The CIA was running drugs, importing drugs into the Mena Airport using federal dollars to do it, using the Mena Airport in Arkansas while Bill Clinton was governor there. He signed off on it. Those people, there's a whole bunch of dirty politicians all over this country. And they keep getting away with doing. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, people. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Because it looks like they're getting the easy life and they get everything their way. And God said, don't you worry about that because that's not going to last. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord. Let me say that again. Trust in the Lord. Let me say that one more time. Trust in the Lord. And do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. You can't, you've got a choice. You can either spend your, your waking hours being envious of how the evildoers are getting away with everything, or you can spend your time learning more about God, learning, building in your faith, increasing your faith, encouraging yourself in God's word, and doing God's will. Which is better for you in the long run? Commit, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Underline that verse in your Bible, write it on the back of your hand, Put that on the bumper sticker of your car. Nail it to your house. Put it on the post and the gates of your door. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee desires of thine heart. This is God's word. He does not lie. 
He does not lie. God is not us to make promises that he does not keep. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say might. He didn't say if you were good enough either. You see, I've read these passages both ways. One way where I read it, where I said to myself, Mike, that might, that might work for other people, but you're too wicked and you're too evil for this to apply to. I've read it that way. And I'm here to tell you, you've heard me preach to you enough. Christ did not die for us while we were good. He died for us while we were bad. If God will do that for you while you were in the gutter of sin, why wouldn't He do something even better than that for you while you're trying to live for Him? Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. And He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. God will show who's right and who is wrong, will He not? Verse 7. Rest in the Lord. You know what that means? Close your eyes tonight and say, God, you've got it. It's in your hand. I'll sleep. You get busy. You got work to do, God. I'm going to go to sleep now. Rest in the Lord and wait. What? What's that word? Say that out loud. Say that out loud. Patiently. Patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. So what if he won? So what if he gets his way all the time? Or she gets her way all the time? So what if all the wicked people, seems like they get away with doing drugs every day, they, do, they get away with stealing every day, they get away with not doing their work every day, they get away with everything! And Jesus, here's Peter. Jesus is giving out instructions to his disciples. And Peter said, well, what about him? What, what are you going to do about John? Peter And Jesus said, Peter, what is that to you? What I do for John, what has that got to do with you? Peter, why don't you trust me and let me do in you what I want to do in you? I'm the master, right? You trust me, right? Why don't you let me tell you what to do? Why don't you let me be the head instead of you worrying about what everybody else has got? You need to, you need to ask God to take the envy out of your heart. I'm preaching this to myself because I've been through this before. I've been done dirty. Every preacher worth his salt gets cheated, lied to, lied about, lied on, lied around, done dirty, backstabbed. Every preacher has that done to him. And you have no idea how many times I've quit. And then finally God said, where are you going to go? I'm taking your keys away. I'm locking all the doors and windows. Where are you going to go? So, verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Don't you dare get back at him. See, I've, I've been through this too. I've been through this. And it doesn't work. And God has shown me in different situations... That what I was trying to do to get my way almost destroyed the whole thing. I should have just trusted God. I've been through this before. For evildoers shall be cut off. Did it say maybe? Did it say I want them to be? No. Evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall what? Read that out. Say that out loud. Am I preaching to just the people online? Look at your Bible again. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they what? Shall inherit the earth. Say that again. Do you believe your Bible? For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Do we not trust God? We come in here every Sunday, every Wednesday, same group. Say amen to the sermon. 
Believe the King James Bible. Do we really believe it? Your faith is always going to be on trial. God is going to test you to show you that, no, you, when, and God's done this with me. Mike, do you trust me? And I was going to lie to God and say, yeah, of course, God, I trust you. I'm Mike Hoggard. And before I could say that, God said, you don't, so don't lie about it. And he was right. I trusted myself and what I wanted more than what God's plan was. That, and it almost got me in a lot of trouble with God. So verse 11 the, the meek shall inherit the earth. Where'd you hear that from? That's in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's where that comes from. And shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Verse 12, the wicked plotteth against the just. How right is that verse? Do you believe that verse? Huh? Do you believe that verse? The wicked plotteth against the just. Do you believe that there are conspirators out there plotting against you and your, and your salvation and trying to tear you down and destroy you? Do you believe that? Do you have, do you not have enemies? So if you believe that part, why don't you believe the rest of it? God is not a man that he should lie. If God says one thing right in this book, everything's right in this book. Or nothing of it is. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he see that his day is coming. Did you not know that? That's what uh, Psalm, what is it, Psalm 2? Yeah, Psalm 2, uh, where it says, uh, God shall have them in derision, something like that. I can't find it now. Why did the heathen rage? People imagine the things that God's going to, God, but he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Psalm 2 verse 4. That's twice in your Bible where God said he's going to laugh at the wicked. Ha ha ha. See what you get? God's going to do that. Verse 14. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be up of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. That's what God said is going to happen to them. A little, you listen to your Bible now. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. I want to hear God's people say amen to that. Let them have it. Let them have it. When, when Israel complained that they were sick and tired of eating manna every day and they wanted some chicken, what did God do? God sent so many quails to them. And the Bible literally says this. It came out their noses. They stuffed themselves and it made them so sick that they puked and it came out of their noses. God said, oh, really, is that what you wanted? Okay, I'll give you what you want. I've been through this. I have been through this. So. Um. Verse 16, a little, uh, verse 17, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. This is why you're still here. It's why you haven't left. Because God was holding you up. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. You pray, hey, I want you, let's pray again right now, because I'm preaching this, and I'm getting... Messages from all over the place telling us that the audio is all messed up. Who do you think's doing that? Father, we pray, dear God, that you would, I don't know, Lord, I've tried everything I can to fix the audio. And I pray, dear God, that you would fix it. God's people need to hear this. Somebody else besides people in this room tonight need to hear this. Lord, just please help us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Verse 19, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. When everybody else is crying because they don't have anything, you're going to have plenty. God does not forsake his people. He stands up for them. God is a team player. God is a team player. He does not leave when the battle gets tough. He stands up for his people. The wicked, verse 20, the wicked 
uh, shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into the smoke. They shall consume away. Verse 21. Verse 21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. Read that out loud. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. This is not the last time you're going to be cheated. Because that's what wicked people do. They cheat. And they just cheat their way through life. They cheat everybody. They cheat the banks. They treat, cheat credit card companies. They cheat stores. They cheat neighbors. They cheat family members. And they cheat friends. All to gain for themselves. But the righteous showeth mercy and what? Giveth. Change your attitude. Change your attitude. Uh, listen, I know this is not easy. I know it's not easy. I've been through it. And some grudges I just don't like letting go of. But I'm telling you, it's better. It's better. Let it go. For such as, such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. That's you. That's you. And you see, you, you start adding up the difference between how God treats us and how God treats lost, wicked people who care nothing about God or anybody else except for themselves. Who has God consistently picked back up when you fell back into sin? God did that. God did that for you. You know what God's, you know what God's doing with your enemies? He's letting them have all the sin and fun that they can have. And then he's going to destroy them. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I just quoted that. I have not ever seen the righteous forsaken. You know who the righteous is? Those who are clothed with Christ. There are no perfect people in this world. They don't exist. But the righteous that he mentions here are the ones who are wearing the garments of righteousness that has been granted to them to wear. So yes, this verse is for you. It really is. Um, verse 26, he is ever merciful and lendeth and in his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Your plans will work. As long as your plans are led by God. The Lord will not leave him. Excuse me. Verse 32. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Do you believe that verse? So let's read this again. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off, and thou shalt see it. Did they do, did Delilah do Samson dirty? Did she do him dirty? She sure did. See, that was his live-in girlfriend. They weren't even married. The man of God. Sitting in the lap of Jezebel herself. Put to sleep. Finally revealing his secret. Sharing his heart with her. And while he slept. She whispered for the guys to come in. Cut the seven locks of his hair off. And he didn't even know it. And when she finally said. Thy enemies be upon thee Samson. And he jumped up. And they got him. They gouged his eyes out. And they put a harness on him. And he was grinding Grinding like, a, like an ox in that temple of Dagon. Did he get to see 
Victory over his enemies. Absolutely. He killed more of his enemies in his death than he did in his life. He's a hero. He is a war hero. And he won. He won. Wait on the Lord, verse 34, and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off, and thou shalt see it. I've seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree. That is the truth. That's why they're trying to impeach the president. They want, the wicked want that power back. The wicked want that power back. And they're going to try to get it. And they're not going to stop. Until they get their power back. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Do you believe your Bible tonight? This Bible is right in everything it says. It is the model upon which we must base our lives, our thoughts, our attitudes, and, and direct our actions. If God told you He will get them, He will get them. I had a middle school principal that I got punched in the nose in the playground by a little squirt kid that I didn't like. He punched me in the nose, bloody my nose. I went running to the principal. Principal's office. Principal come out and said, what happened to you? I said, so-and-so, Tim, punched me in the nose. He said, I'll get him. Never did. Never did. So you know what? I didn't go running to the principal ever again. Because I knew what, what good's it going to do, right? But I've run to God every time. I trust God. I trust God. There's, a, there's someone here tonight that recently God has absolutely shown his awesome power and his greatness to this person in this room tonight in a way that nobody ever thought could have ever be done. God did it. And God will do it again. I have been through some rough, rough things in my life. Some of them self-inflicted. Some of them not. And you get tired of the pity party. You get tired of the bitterness. You get tired of the anger. And you just trust God. Trust Him. Because he's all we've got. I don't have tons of money where I can bribe people to do what I want. I don't have connections with tough guys who can take care of stuff behind the scenes. I'm not well respected in Jefferson County so that I can get my way all the time. I'm just a guy that most people don't like because of what I say. I'm just a guy trying to serve God, trying to preach this book the way it is, and have made a lot of enemies doing it. And I've had no choice in my life but to trust God or I would not be here tonight. I'd be gone. You know what I got a call today, Brother George? I got a call from Gibbon, Africa. Have you ever heard of the nation of Gibbon? It's there. A man bought minutes on his phone so he could call me to tell me, thank you, Pastor. You have saved my life. He said, I used to be a homosexual. 
And he said, I started watching your videos and God has brought me out of that. And I'm born again and I'm saved and I'm reading the King James Bible and I'm trying to tell everybody I can to, they need to watch you on the internet. He said, keep them coming. We need them. I'll keep doing it if it's just for that one man. Okay? We don't have a choice but to trust God. Amen? Now, uh, we're studying the Word of God. Turn to Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. L let me put it to you like this. Do we believe that God judges everybody? Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Uh, now, I saw some heads not on this side. I didn't see nobody on this side. Do we believe that God judges everybody? So if there's something going on between two people and God judges them, don't you think it's the smart route to please God and be on His side and do what He says so that when the judgment comes down and He starts slapping people, He's slapping the other guy. Don't you think that's the right move? Amen. Romans 10, 17. The Bible, the Bible is the sole source of faith. You will not get faith from any other. You will not get faith from my preaching. You will not get faith from somebody else's preaching. You will not get faith from radio preachers, from TV preachers. You will not get faith on your own. You were not born with faith. The sole source of faith is the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So then faith. Cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The more faith, the more you read this Bible, the more you will believe this Bible. If you do not read the Bible, then you will not believe the Bible. Amen? Autumn learned something today she never knew before. That DNA is found in the King James Bible, right? I showed it to her and she went, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I know it is. This Bible is right. The more you read this Bible, the more your faith will come, the more you will trust God. I prayed last night. God didn't tell me to go get a magazine out. God didn't tell me to go get a catalog out. God didn't tell me to go to Drudge Report or eBay or watch a YouTube video. God said, fret not thyself over evildoers. He gave me scripture and I believe it. Our, I spelled that word wrong. Sanctification. It's not sanctification. It is sanctification. You know what that word means? You are made pure by the word of God. Amen? Okay. So you're out rubbing shoulders with lost people all day long who are cursing. Telling dirty jokes, talking about evil things that they do, and you hear that. That goes in your head. You need to be brainwashed. Your brain needs to be washed. It needs to get that junk out of it because what goes in will eventually come out. Will it not? So you need your mind cleaned out and the only thing that will do that. 1 Timothy 4, 5, 4, it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. This is how God lets us eat ham and bacon. Now God told us in the Old Testament, don't eat pigs. I love pigs. I love ham. I love bacon. I love ribs. I love Pork loin. I love it. But God said don't eat it. Why? It was unclean. So I tell people. God didn't change the law. He cleaned the pig. And, if, and that's what that verse is about. It's about eating stuff. 
That in the Old Testament, it said don't eat. But what was the reason why God said don't eat it? It's unclean. Don't eat it. It's unclean. Well, what if God cleans it? Well, I guess it's okay then. And that's what God did. He didn't change the law. He cleaned that which was unclean. Because he said that food you eat is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Which you ought to do before you ever eat. You ought to honor and respect God before you ever put food in your mouth. And you ought to teach that to your children. Somebody say amen. If God can clean up, you think God cares about ham and bacon? Careth God for the ox? Careth God for pigs? No. God is saying that to us. God can clean what's unclean. And how does he do it? Sanctified by the word of God. It is our sanctification. It is unbound. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Hey, I want to see your fingers going to war here. That's what it sounds like. Autumn had my Bible in her hand a while ago and she said, wow, you can tell this Bible's been opened a lot. It just falls open. It's not stiff. On the Bible, 2 Timothy, where's 2 Timothy? Chapter 2, verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Do you really think that there are people in this world that are more powerful than this book? Do you really think that? Because, you know, when I watch conspiracy videos on, on the internet, it always sounds like the Illuminati gets away with everything and we have no way to stop them and they're just going to get away with everything and they're going to take everybody's souls away. No, they're not. God's only letting them do what He's going to let them do for a reason. But the Word of God is not bound. The Word of, in fact, when Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, what does He have shooting out of His mouth? A sharp two-edged sword, which is the Word of God. How's he going to defeat everybody? With the Bible. Your Bible's not bound. Your Bible, it, I, don't, I don't care if it's forbidden in some country. God will find a way to get it in there. He always does. Then, I want to show you this. It's effectual. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. First, go backwards. You found Timothy, now find Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. I want to show you something. Look up on the screen. You're going to get a science lesson tonight. Autumn, all that stuff I showed you about DNA, I had a reason for it. So I knew what I was going to say tonight. I'm going to show you how your Bible works. It is effectual. It is effectual. Do you know what that means? That means if you take, if you've got like a, you get up in the morning, your back aches. You take ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory and it works. Okay? They got the recipe from some shamans down in Brazil. I don't, that's, that's the truth that they, the company, they were using some kind of substance down in South America to, to help pain with pain relief and anti-inflammatory. And they said they got it. The spirits told them how to get it. Well, the pharmaceutical company got the formula from them, synthesized it, and created ibuprofen. That's how we have it. Now, ibuprofen does no good just sitting in the bottle. Amen? Boy, my back aches. I need ibuprofen. I got a whole bottle of it. What do you got to do? Take it. Take the medicine. That's the only way that it works. Amen? Now, do you have to instruct the ibuprofen on what it's supposed to do? Your body already knows what to do with it. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. So if I can show you DNA written in the Bible 3,000 years ago, that tells you that it's not written by men. It was written by God who created DNA. Which you've heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So, here's, and here's a big, this is a big thing with me. Do you have to purposely make the word of God do what it's supposed to do? The answer is no, you don't. 
The Word of God is alive, is it not? For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's already alive. This Bible is smarter than you are. You don't tell it what to do. It tells you what to do. And it works automatically. Do you know what that means? I'm going to show you something. There is a machine in your body called RNA polymerase. Everybody say that word. Say RNA, RNA polymerase. Say polymerase. Polymerase. Just say plumerase if you want. Plumerase. Okay? It's a machine in your body. Do you know where it came from? DNA made it. Do you know what it does? It makes DNA make things. So here's the question. Which came first? The DNA that makes the machine that causes the DNA to work or the machine that makes the DNA work? Which come first? I don't know. I just know that when my daddy fell in love with my mama, here I am. I don't know how it works. I'm here. Amen. So watch this. Matthew 6, 27. Look at that verse up there. Which, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Do you know what Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers are constantly trying to tell you? They're trying to tell you that the reason why Cubby is short is because he didn't think tall. It's your fault. You're not Cubby, you're Stubby. Amen? I love this guy. But Joyce Myers tells you that you didn't think tall thoughts, that's why you're short. If you would think tall thoughts, you would be tall. That's stupid. Amen? So let me show you what this little machine does. This machine scans all the one billion or three billion base pairs of your DNA. And it receives an instruction from your body that your body needs to make your fan and so your body needs to make some more sweat. Right? Or you just ate and your body needs to make some insulin to get the food into the cells where it belongs. So how does that work? The machine called RNA polymerase scans all the three billion codes of DNA, finds the exact chapter and verse where the directions are to make insulin. And it reads, it first of all, it reads the DNA. And when it finds where it's, the, the insulin is going to be made, it, it makes a copy. It rightly divides it, Brother George, rightly dividing the word of truth. It splits it open. It unrolls it like a scroll, takes that verse, makes a copy of that verse that makes insulin, takes that copy and then begins to read the instructions and it starts grabbing proteins. And then it starts putting the proteins together, fitting them where they belong, like putting together a barbecue grill. A Chinese barbecue grill translated by an uneducated Chinaman. This works better. It takes the proteins, adds them together, and then it, there's a process called protein folding. It folds them, just like origami, it folds them in just exactly the right way so that when it's done, it has an insulin protein built for you. And it sends it where it needs to. And if it needs more, it'll, make, it'll just keep making it until it's done. It doesn't need it anymore. It makes white blood cells, it makes red blood cells, it makes bone marrow, it makes heart muscles and, and heart tissue, it makes lung tissue. It, you, when you scrape yourself and lose some skin and some blood, it'll make some more skin and some more blood for you. The, my point is this, you have this glorious book in you called DNA and you don't have to instruct your DNA to do what it does every single day. You don't have to tell it to do it. It does it automatically for you. Are you getting this? So you wonder why things are going wrong in your life and nothing's working? You haven't opened up the DNA. 
You've got to open the book, people. You've got to open the book. You've got to read it. You've got to think on it. You've got to meditate on it. You've got to spend time with God in it. You have to. Because if your body, even if you don't have diabetes, if your body stops making insulin, you'll be dead in two days. Because all your cells will starve to death. Because that's the only thing that puts the sugar that you ate into the cells. You'll die. Read your Bible. And then let God work it in. Let's read that verse again. You received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It does the work. You don't have to, and you can't anyway. Somebody say amen. I need stuff like this. Think of it as grandma with a recipe. The recipe doesn't make the cake. It doesn't make the cookies. Does it? Grandma makes the cookies, but she does it by the recipe. Who in here has got a recipe book from your grandma? Isn't that the neatest thing in the world? Because she had secrets in there that she didn't tell nobody. But that's how she did, made all those amazing things that grandmas make. Is that she read the recipe and she did it. And that's the word of God working in you, doing what you cannot do for yourself. Read this book, people. It's alive. It's powerful. For the word of God, I just said that. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. And as the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God will judge your thoughts and your intents, will he not? Does not God, See, that's probably one of the reasons why you didn't read the Bible. Because you didn't want it knowing what you were thinking. Because you were afraid that you were going to read something that was going to make you feel guilty. And you're not going to read it. 1 John 2.14, I've written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you. You know what that word abide means? Lives. I abide in my house. My wife is abiding in my house right now. My daughter and grandchildren abide in my house. That means they live there. And the word of God is parked inside your garage and it lives there. Don't chase it out. The word of God is good. Hebrews 6, 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now, Autumn, didn't you like what I shared with you today? Did you not? Wasn't that the neatest thing? I taught her about DNA and the 46. And I had her count the words that Adam spoke. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she came out of man and therefore shall... You know, the two shall become one flesh. And there was 46 words there exactly. And I just told her about the 46 chromosomes. She's going, that's amazing. That's going to abide in you and live in you. And hopefully it'll never go away. And it's good. And it has creative power. Hebrews eleven three. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. What did God make everything out of? Nothing. If you buy a 3D printer, it doesn't just magically print out stuff. It makes it from something. You got to feed stuff in it. Then it makes it. That's, and, but that's not how God's word works. God can take nothing and turn it into everything. Because that's what he's already done. It's got creative power. Verse 2 Peter 3, 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of that the, by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And it was all made by the word of God. You read Genesis 1. It'll tell you. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let this. And God said, let that. God said, let us make man in our image. It was all done by God's word. And I'm telling, listen, I'm telling my family. That, that, that. 
Tell them my family. You can hold that bladder for just two more minutes. I'm telling my family, we trust this book. Or I won't be your pastor no more. We trust this book. And we're going to follow this book. And we're going to wait on God. And we're going to trust God. And we're going to let God take care of it. Amen? Because we don't have another choice. We don't have another choice. 